Sarah Paretsky's private eye, V.I. Warshawski, helped to define the new female sleuth in modern American crime fiction. Each of the Warshawski books published to date, Bitter Medicine, Killing Orders, Deadlock, Indemnity Only, Bloodshot, and Burn Marks, has attracted a larger readership, with the last named novel making a number of national and regional bestseller lists. Miss Paretsky and her creation both live and work in Chicago. Settled Score by Sarah Paretsky. Chapter One. It's such a difficult concept to deal with. I just don't like to use that word. Paul Savino turned to me, his mobile mouth pursed consideringly. I put it to you, Victoria. You're a lawyer. Would you not agree? I agree that the law defines responsibility differently than we do when we're talking about social or moral relations, I said carefully. No state's attorney is going to try to get Mrs. Hampton arrested. But does that... You see? Servino interrupted. That's just my point. But it's not mine, Lottie said fiercely, her thick, dark brows forming a forbidding line across her forehead. And if you had seen Claudia with her guts torn out by lie, perhaps you would think a little differently. The table was silenced for a moment. We were surprised by the violent edge to Lottie's anger. Penelope Herschel shook her head slightly at Servino. He caught her eye and nodded. Sorry, Lottie. I didn't mean to upset you so much. Lottie forced herself to smile. Paul, you think you develop a veneer after 30 years as a doctor. You think you see people in all their pain and that your professionalism protects you from too much feeling. But that girl was 15. She had her life in front of her. She didn't want to have a baby. And her mother wanted her to, not for religious reasons even. She's English with all their contempt for Catholicism. But because she hoped to continue to control her daughter's life. Claudia felt overwhelmed by her mother's pressure and swallowed a jar of oven cleaner. Now don't tell me the mother is not responsible. I do not give one damn if no court would try her. To me, she caused her daughter's death as surely as if she had poured the poison into her. Servino ignored another slight headshake from Lottie's niece. It is a tragedy, but a tragedy for the mother, too. You don't think she meant her daughter to kill herself, do you, Lottie? Lottie gave a tense smile. What goes on in the unconscious is surely your department, Paul. But perhaps that was Mrs. Hampton's wish. Of course. If she didn't intend for Claudia to die, the courts would find her responsibility diminished. Am I not right, Vic? I moved uneasily in my chair. I didn't want to referee this argument. It had all the earmarks of the kind of domestic fight where both contestants attacked the police. Besides, while the rest of the dinner party was interested in the case and sympathetic to Lottie's feelings, none of them cared about the question of legal versus moral responsibility. The dinner was in honor of Lottie Herschel's niece, Penelope, making one of her periodic scouting forays into Chicago's fashion scene. Her father, Lottie's only brother, owned a chain of high-priced women's dress shops in Montreal, Quebec, and Toronto. He was thinking of making Chicago his U.S. beachhead, and Penelope was out looking at locations as well as previewing the Chicago designer's spring ideas. Lottie usually gave a dinner for Penelope when she was in town. Savino was always invited. An analyst friend of Lottie's, he and Penelope had met on one of her first buying trips to Chicago. Since then, they'd seen as much of each other as two busy professionals half a continent apart could manage. Although their affair now had five years of history to it, Penelope continued to stay with Lottie when she was in town. The rest of the small party included Max Lowenthal, the executive director of Beth Israel, where Lottie treated perinatal patients, and Chaim Lemke, a clarinetist with the Aeolus Woodwind Quintet. A slight, melancholy man... He had met Lottie and Max in London, where they'd all been refugees. Chaim's wife, Greta, who played harpsichord and piano for an early music group, didn't come along. 
Lottie said not to invite her because she was seeing Paul professionally. But anyway, since she was currently living with the oldest oboist, Rudolf Strayon, she probably wouldn't have accepted. We were eating at my apartment. Lottie had called earlier in the day, rattled by the young girl's death and needing help putting the evening together. She was so clearly beside herself that I'd felt compelled to offer my own place. With cheese and fruit after dinner, Lottie had begun discussing the case with the whole group, chiefly expressing her outrage with the legal system that let Mrs. Hampton off without so much as a warning. For some reason, Servino continued to argue the point, despite Penelope's warning frowns. Perhaps the fact that we were on our third bottle of Barolo explained the lapse from Paul's usual sensitive courtesy. Mrs. Hampton did not point the gun at the girl's head and force her to become pregnant, he said. The daughter was responsible too, if you want to use that word. And the boy, the father, whoever that was. Lottie, normally abstemious, had drunk her share of the wine. Her black eyes glittered and her Viennese accent became pronounced. I know the argument, believe you me, Paul. It's the old who pulled the trigger. The person who fired the gun, the person who manufactured it, the person who created the situation, the parents who created the shooter. To me, that is scholastic hair-splitting. You know, all that crap they used to teach us a thousand years ago in Europe. Who is the ultimate cause, the immediate cause, the sufficient cause, and on and on. It's dry theory, not life. It takes people off the hook for their own actions. You can quote Heinz Kohut and the rest of your self-psychologists to me all night, but you will never convince me that people are unable to make conscious choices for their actions or that parents are not responsible for how they treat their children. It's the same thing as saying the Nazis were not responsible for how they treated Europe. Penelope gave a strained smile. She loved both Lottie and Savino, and didn't want either of them to make fools of themselves. Max, on the other hand, watched Lottie affectionately. He liked to see her passionate. Chaim was staring into space, his lips moving. I assumed he was reading a score in his head. I would say that, Sabino snapped, his own Italian accent strong. And don't look at me as though I were Joseph Goebbels. Chaim and I are ten years younger than you and Max, but we share your story in great extent. I do not condone or excuse the horrors our family suffered or our own dispossession. But I can look at Himmler or Mussolini or even Hitler and say they behaved in such and such a way because of weaknesses accentuated in them by history, by their parents, by their culture. You could as easily say the French were responsible. The French because their need for... for... Rapesaglia. What am I trying to say, Victoria? Reprisal, I supplied. Now you see, Lottie, now I too am angry. I forget my English. But if they and the English had not stretched Germany without reparations, the situation might have been different. So how can you claim responsibility for one person or for one nation? You just have to do the best you can with what is going on around you. Lottie's face was set. Yes, Paul, I know what you're saying. Yes, the French created a situation, and the English wished to accommodate Hitler. And the Americans would not take in the Jews. All these things are true. But the Germans chose, nonetheless. They could have acted differently. I will not take them off the hook just because other people should have acted differently. I took her hand and squeezed it. At the risk of being the Neville Chamberlain in the case, could I suggest some appeasement? Heim brought his clarinet and Max his violin. Paul, if you'll play the piano, Penelope and I will sing. Chaim smiled, relaxing the sadness in his thin face. He loved making music, whether with friends or professionals. Gladly, Vic. But only a few songs. It's late, and we go to California for a two-week tour tomorrow. The atmosphere lightened. We went into the living room, where Chaim flipped through my music, pulling out Wolf's Spanish's Liederbuch. In the end, he and Max stayed with Lottie, playing and talking until three in the morning, long after Savino and Penelope's departure. Chapter Two The detective business is not as much fun in January as at other times of the year. 
I spent the next two days forcing my little Chevy through unplowed side streets, trying to find a missing witness who was the key to an $18 million fraud case. I finally succeeded Tuesday evening a little before five. By the time I'd convinced the terrified woman who was hiding with a niece at 67th and Honoré that no one would shoot her if she testified, gotten her to the state's attorney and seen her safely home again, it was close to ten o'clock. I fumbled with the outer locks on the apartment building with my mind fixed on a hot bath, lots of whiskey and a toasted cheese sandwich. When the ground floor door opened and Mr. Contreras popped out to meet me, I ground my teeth. He's a retired machinist with more energy than Navratilova. I didn't have the stamina to deal with him tonight. I mumbled a greeting and headed for the stairs. There you are, doll. The relief in his voice was marked. I stopped wearily. Some crisis with the dog. Something involving lugging a 60-pound retriever to the vet through snow-packed streets. I thought I ought to let her in, you know. I told her there was no saying when you'd be home. Sometimes you're gone all night on the case. A delicate reference to my love life. But she was all set she had to wait. She'd been sitting on the stairs all this time. She won't say what the problem is, but you'd probably better talk to her. You want to come in here, or should I send her up in a few minutes? Not the dog, then. Uh, who is it? Aren't I trying to tell you? That beautiful girl, you know, the doc's niece. Penelope? I echoed foolishly. She came out into the hall just then, ducking under the old man's gesticulating arms. Vic, thank God you're back. I've got to talk to you before the police do anything stupid. She was huddled in an ankle-length silver fur. Ordinarily elegant, with exquisite makeup and jewelry and the most modern of hairstyles, she didn't much resemble her aunt. But shock had stripped the sophistication from her, making her dark eyes the focus of her face. She looked so much like Lottie that I went to her instinctively. Come on up with me and tell me what's wrong. I put an arm around her. Mr. Contreras closed his door in disappointment as we disappeared up the stairs. Penelope waited until we were inside my place before saying anything else. I slung my jacket and down vest on the hooks in the hallway and went into the living room to undo my heavy walking shoes. Penelope kept her fur wrapped around her. Her high-heeled kid boots were not meant for streetwear. They were rimmed with salt stains. She shivered slightly, despite the coat. Have, have you heard anything? I shook my head, rubbing my right foot, stiff from driving all day. It's Paul. He's dead. But, but he's not that old. And I thought he was very healthy. Because of his sedentary job... Servino always ran the two miles from his loop office to his apartment in the evening. Penelope gave a little gulp of hysterical laughter. Oh, he was very fit. Could not help you enough to overcome a blow to the head. Could you tell me the story from the beginning instead of letting it out in little dramatic bursts? As I'd hoped, my rudeness got her angry enough to overcome her incipient hysteria. After flashing me a Lottie-like look of royal disdain, she told me what she knew. Paul's office was in a building where a number of analysts had their practices. A sign posted on his door this morning boldly announced that he had cancelled all his day's appointments because of a personal emergency. When a janitor went in at three to change a light bulb, he found the doctor dead on the floor of his consulting room. Colleagues agreed they'd seen Servino arrive around quarter of eight, as he usually did. They'd seen the notice and assumed he'd left when everyone else was tied up with appointments. No one thought any more about it. Penelope had learned of her lover's death from the police, who picked her up as she was leaving a realtor's office where she'd been discussing shop leases. Two of the doctors with offices near Servino's had mentioned seeing a dark-haired woman in a long fur coat near his consulting room. Penelope's dark eyes were drenched with tears. It's not enough that Paul is dead, but I learned of it in such an unspeakable way. They think I killed him because I have dark hair and wear a fur coat. They don't know what killed him, some dreary blunt instrument. Oh, it sounds stupid and banal like an old Agatha Christie. They poured through my luggage looking for it. They questioned her for three hours while they searched, 
and finally, reluctantly, let her go, with a warning not to leave Chicago. She'd called Lottie at the clinic, and then come over to find me. I went into the dining room for some whiskey. She shook her head at the bottle. I poured myself an extra slug to make up for missing my bath. And? And, and I want you to find who killed him. The police aren't looking very hard because they think it's me. Do they have a reason for this? She blushed unexpectedly. They think he was refusing to marry me. Not much motive in these times, one would have thought. And you with a successful career to boot. Was he refusing? No. It was the other way around, actually. I felt... I felt unsettled about what I wanted to do. Come to Chicago to stay, you know. I, I have friends in Montreal, too, you know, and... I've always thought marriage meant monogamy. I see. My focus on the affair between Penelope and Paul shifted slightly. You didn't kill him, did you? Perhaps for some other reason? She forced a smile. Because he didn't agree with Lottie about responsibility? No, and for no other reason. Are you going to ask Lottie if she killed him? Lottie would have mangled him Sunday night with whatever was lying on the dining room table... She wouldn't wait to sneak into his office with a club. I eyed her thoughtfully. Just out of vulgar curiosity, what were you doing around eight this morning? Her black eyes scorched me. I came to you because I thought you would be sympathetic. Not to get the same damn questions I had all afternoon from the police. And what were you doing at eight this morning? She swept across the room to the door, then thought better of it and affected to study a Nell Blaine poster on the nearby wall. With her back to me, she said curtly, I was having a second cup of coffee. And no, there are no witnesses. As you know, by that time of day, Lottie is long gone. Perhaps someone saw me leave the building at 8.30. I asked the detectives to question the neighbors, but they didn't seem much interested in doing so. Don't sell them short. If you're not under arrest, they're still asking questions. But you could ask questions to clear me. They're just trying to implicate me. I pinched the bridge of my nose, trying to ease the dull ache behind my eyes. You do realize the likeliest person to have killed him is an angry patient, don't you? Despite your fears, the police have probably been questioning them all day. Nothing I said could convince her that she wasn't in imminent danger of a speedy trial before a kangaroo court with execution probable by the next morning. She stayed until past midnight, alternating pleas to hide her with commands to join the police in hunting down Paul's killer. She wouldn't call Lottie to tell her she was with me because she was afraid Lottie's home phone had been tapped. Look, Penelope, I finally said, exasperated, I can't hide you. If the police really suspect you, you were tailed here. Even if I could figure out a way to smuggle you out and conceal you someplace, I wouldn't do it. I'd lose my license on obstruction charges, and I deserve to. I tried explaining how hard it was to get a court order for a wiretap, and finally gave up. I was about ready to start screaming with frustration when Lottie herself called, devastated by Savino's death and worried about Penelope. The police had been by with a search warrant, and had taken away an array of household objects, including her umbrella. Such an intrusion would normally have made her spitting mad, but she was too upset to give it her full emotional attention. I turned the phone over to Penelope. Whatever Lottie said to her stained her cheeks red, but did make her agree to let me drive her home. When I got back to my place, exhausted enough to sleep round the clock, I found John McGonagall waiting for me in a blue and white outside my building. He came up the walk behind me and opened the door with a flourish. I looked at him sourly. Thanks, Sergeant. It's been a long day. I'm glad to have a doorman at the end of it. It's kind of cold down here for talking, Vic. How about inviting me up for coffee? Because I want to go to bed. If you've got something you want to say or even ask, Spit it out down here. I was just ventilating and I knew it. If a police sergeant wanted to talk to me at one in the morning, we'd talk. Mr. Contreras is coming out in a magenta bathrobe to see what the trouble was nearly speeded my decision to cooperate. 
While I assembled cheese sandwiches, McGonagall asked me what I'd learned from Penelope. She didn't throw her arms around me and howl, Vic, I've killed him. You've got to help me. I put the sandwiches in a skillet with a little olive oil. What have you guys got on her? The receptionist and two of the other analysts who'd been in the hall had seen a small, dark-haired woman hovering in the alcove near Savina's office around 20 of 8. Neither of them had paid too much attention to her. When they saw Penelope, they agreed it might have been she, but they couldn't be certain. If they'd made a positive ID, she'd already have been arrested, even though they couldn't find the weapon. They had a shouting match at the filigree last night. The maitre d' was quite upset. Savina was a regular, and he didn't want to offend him, but a number of diners complained. The Herschel girl, McGonagall eyed me warily, woman, I mean, stormed off on her own and spent the night with her aunt. One of the neighbors saw her leave around 7 the next morning, not at 8.30, as she says. I didn't like the sound of that. I asked him about the cause of death. Someone gave him a good crack across the side of the neck, close enough to the back to fracture a cervical vertebra and sever one of the main arteries. It would have killed him pretty fast. And as you know, Servina wasn't very tall. The Herschel woman could easily have done it. With what? I demanded. That was the stumbling block. It could have been anything from a baseball bat to a steel pipe. The forensic pathologist who'd looked at the body favored the latter since the skin had been broken in places. They'd taken away anything in Lottie's apartment and Penelope's luggage that might have done the job and were having them examined for traces of blood and skin. I snorted. If you searched Lottie's place, you must have come away with quite an earful. McGonagall grimaced. She spoke her mind, yes. Any ideas on what the weapon might have been? I shook my head, too nauseated by the thought of Paul's death to muster intellectual curiosity over the choice of weapon. When McGonagall left around 2.30, I lay in bed staring at the dark, unable to sleep despite my fatigue. I didn't know Penelope all that well. Just because she was Lottie's niece didn't mean she was incapable of murder. To be honest, I hadn't been totally convinced by her histrionics tonight. Who but a lover could get close enough to you to snap your neck? I thrashed around for hours, finally dropping into an uneasy sleep around six. Lottie woke me at eight to implore me to look for Servina's killer. The police had been back at 7.30 to ask Penelope why she'd forgotten to mention she'd been at Paul's apartment early yesterday morning. Why was she there? I asked reasonably. She says she wanted to patch things up after their quarrel, but he'd already left for the office. When the police started questioning her, she was too frightened to tell the truth. Vic, I'm terrified they're going to arrest her. I mumbled something. It looked to me like they had a pretty good case, but I valued my life too much to say that to Lottie. Even so, the conversation deteriorated rapidly. I'd come out in any wind or weather to patch you up, with never a word of complaint. That wasn't exactly true, but I let it pass. Now, when I beg you for help, you turn a deaf ear to me. I shall remember this, Victoria. Giant black spots formed and reformed in front of my tired eyes. Great, Lottie. Her receiver banged in my ear. Chapter 3 I spent the day doggedly going about my own business, turning on WBBM whenever I was in the car to see if any news had come in about Penelope's arrest. Despite all the damaging eyewitness reports, the city apparently didn't want to move without a weapon. I trudged up the stairs to my apartment a little after six, my mind fixed on a bath and a rare steak followed immediately by bed. When I got to the top landing... I ground my teeth in futile rage. A fur-coated woman was sitting in front of the door. When she got to her feet, I realized it wasn't Penelope, but Greta Schippar, Prime Nemke's wife. The dark hallway had swallowed the gold of her hair. Vic, thank God you've come back. I've been here since four, and I have a concert in two hours. I fumbled with the three stiff locks. I have an office downtown just so that people won't have to sit on the floor outside my home, 
I said pointedly. You do? Oh, it never occurred to me you didn't just work out of your living room. She followed me in and headed over to the piano where she picked out a series of fifths. You really should get this tune, Vic. Is that why you've been here for two hours? To tell me to tune my piano? I slung my coat onto a hook in the entryway and sat on the couch to pull off my boots. No, no. She sat down hastily. It's because of Paul, of course. I spoke to Lottie today and she says you're refusing to stir yourself to look for his murderer. Why, Vic? We all need you very badly. You can't let us down now. The police were questioning me for two hours yesterday. It utterly destroyed my concentration. I couldn't practice at all. I know the recital tonight will be a disaster. Even Heim's been affected, and he's out on the West Coast. I was too tired to be tactful. How do you know that? I thought you'd been living with Rudolf Strayon. She looked surprised. What does that have to do with anything? I'm still interested in Heim's music. And it's been terrible. Rudolph called this morning to tell me, and I bought an L.A. paper downtown. She thrust a copy of the L.A. Times in front of me. It was folded back to the art section, where the headline read, Aeolus just blowing in the wind. They'd used Crime's publicity photo as an inset. I scanned the story. Heim Lemke, one of the nation's most brilliant musicians, must have left his own clarinet at home because he played as though he'd never handled the instrument before. Aeolus manager Claudia Lorenz says the group was shattered by the murder of a friend in Chicago. The rest of the quintet managed to pull a semblance of a concert together that the performance by America's top woodwind group was definitely off-key. I handed the paper back to Greta. Heim's reputation is too strong. An adverse review like this will be forgotten in two days. Don't worry about it. Go to your concert and concentrate on your own music. Her slightly protuberant blue eyes stared at me. I didn't believe Lottie when she told me. I don't believe I'm hearing you now. Vic, we need you. If it's money, name your figure. But put aside this coldness and help us out. Greta, the only thing standing between the police and an arrest right now is the fact that they can't find the murder weapon. I'm not going to join them in hunting for it. The best we can hope for is that they never find it. After a while, they'll let Penelope go back to Montreal and your lives will return to normal. No, no. You're thinking Penelope committed this crime. Never, Vic, never. I've known her since she was a small child. You know, I grew up in Montreal. It's where I met Heim. Believe me, I know her. She never committed this murder. She was still arguing stubbornly when she looked at her watch, gave a gasp, and said she had to run or she'd never make the auditorium in time. When I'd locked the door, thankfully, behind her, I saw she dropped her paper. I looked at Heim's delicate face again, sad as though he knew he would have to portray mourning in it when the picture was taken. Chapter 4 When the police charged Penelope late on Thursday, I finally succumbed to the alternating pleas and commands of her friends to undertake an independent investigation. The police had never found a weapon, but the state's attorney was willing to believe it was in the Chicago River. I got the names of the two analysts and the receptionist who'd seen Servina's presumed assailant outside his office on Tuesday. They were too used to seeing nervous people shrinking behind partitions to pay much attention to this woman. Neither of them was prepared to make a positive ID in court. That would be a help to Freeman Carter, handling Penelope's defense but it couldn't undo the damage caused by Penelope's original lies about her Tuesday morning activities. She was free on a $100,000 bond. Swinging between depression and a kind of manic rage, she didn't tell a very convincing story. Still, I was committed to proving her innocence. I did my best with her and trusted that Freeman was too savvy to let her take the witness stand herself. I got a list of Paul's patients both current and former, from a contact at the police. Lottie, Max, and Greta were bankrolling both Freeman and me to any amount we needed, so I hired the Streeter brothers to check up on patient alibis. I talked to all of them myself, trying to ferret out any sense of betrayal or rage urgent enough to drive one of them to murder. With a sense of shameful voyeurism, I even read Paul's notes. 
I was fascinated by his descriptions of Greta. Her total self-absorption had always rubbed me the wrong way. Paul, while much more empathic, seemed to be debating whether she would ever be willing to participate in her own analysis. How did Paul feel about your affair with Rudolf? I asked Greta one afternoon when she had made one of her frequent stops for a progress report. Oh, you know, Paul, he had a great respect for the artistic temperament and what someone like me needs to survive in my work. Besides, he convinced me I didn't have to feel responsible. You know that my own parents' cold narcissism makes me crave affection. And Rudolf is a much more relaxing lover than poor Heim with his endless parade of guilt and self-doubt. I felt my skin crawl slightly. I didn't know any psychoanalytic theory, but I couldn't believe Paul meant his remarks on personal responsibility to be understood in quite this way. Meanwhile, Heim's performance had deteriorated so badly that he decided to cancel the rest of the West Coast tour. The Aeolus found a backup, the second clarinet in the Chicago Symphony, but the concert series got mediocre reviews in Seattle and played to half-full houses in Vancouver and Denver. Greta rushed to the airport to meet Heim on his return. I knew because she'd notified the local stations and I found her staring at me on the ten o'clock news, escorting Heim from the baggage area with a maternal solicitude. She shed the cameras before decamping for Rudolph's. She called me from there at ten-thirty to make sure I'd seen her wifely heroics. I wasn't convinced by Greta's claims that Heim would recover faster on his own than with someone to look after him. The next day I went to check on him for myself. Even though it was past noon... He was still in his dressing gown. I apologized for waking him, but he gave a sweet, sad smile and assured me he'd been up for some time. When I followed him into the living room, a light, bright room facing Lake Michigan, I was shocked to see how ill he looked. His black eyes had become giant holes in his thin face. He apparently hadn't slept in some time. Heim, have you seen a doctor? No, no. He shook his head. It's just that since Paul's death, I can't make music. I try to play and I sound worse than I did at age five. I don't know which is harder. Losing Paul or having them arrest Penelope. Such a sweet girl. I've known her since she was born. I'm sure she didn't kill him. Lottie says you're investigating? Yeah, but not too successfully. The evidence against her is very sketchy. It's hard for me to believe they'll get a conviction. If the weapon turns up... I left the sentence trail away. If the weapon turned up, it might provide the final case and to shore up the state's platform. I was trying hard to work for Penelope, but kept having disloyal thoughts. You yourself are hunting for the weapon? Do you know what it is? I shook my head. The state's attorney gave me photos of the wound. I had enlargements made, and I took them to a pathologist I know to see if he could come up with any ideas. Some kind of pipe or stick with spikes or something on it, like a caveman's club. I'm so out of ideas, I even went to the field museum to see if they could suggest something or were missing some old-fashioned lethal weapon. Time had turned green. I felt contrite. He had such an active imagination, I should have watched my tongue. Now he'd have nightmares for weeks and would wait even longer to get his music back. I changed the subject and persuaded him to let me cook some lunch from the meager supplies in the kitchen. He didn't eat much, but he was looking less feverish when I left. Chapter 5 Heinemann found him close to death the morning Penelope's trial started. Lottie, Max, and I spent the day in court with Lottie's brother Hugo and his wife. We didn't get any of Greta's frantic messages until Lottie checked in at the clinic before dinner. Heim had gone to an Aeolus rehearsal the night before, his first appearance at the group in some weeks. He had bought a new clarinet, thinking perhaps the problem lay with the old one. Wind instruments aren't like violins, they deteriorate over time, 
And an active clarinetist has to buy a new one every ten years or so. Despite the new instrument, a buffet he had flown to Toronto to buy, the rehearsal had gone badly. He left early, going home to turn on the gas in the kitchen stove. He left a note which simply said, I have destroyed my music. The cleaning woman knew enough about their life to call Greta at Rudolph's apartment. Since Greta had been at the rehearsal, waiting for the oboist, she knew how badly Chaim had played. I'm not surprised, she told Lottie over the phone. His music was all he had after I left him. With both of us gone from his life, he must have felt he had no reason to live. Thank God I learned so much from Paul about why we aren't responsible for our actions, or I would feel terribly guilty now. Lottie called the attending physician at Mitchell Hospital and came away with the news that Heim would live, but he'd ruined his lungs. He could hardly talk and would probably never be able to play again. She reported her conversation with Greta with a blazing rage while we waited for dinner in her brother's suite at the Drake. The wrong person's career is over, she said furiously. It's the one thing I could never understand about Heim, why he felt so much passion for that self-centered whore. Marcella Herschel gave a grimace of distaste. She didn't deal well with Lottie at the best of times and could barely tolerate her when she was angry. Penelope, pale and drawn from the day's ordeal, summoned a smile and patted Lottie's shoulder soothingly while Max tried to persuade her to drink a little wine. Freeman Carter stopped by after dinner to discuss strategy for the next day's session. The evening broke up soon after, all of us too tired and depressed to want even a pretense of conversation. The trial lasted four days. Freeman did a brilliant job with the state sketchy evidence. The jury was out for only two hours before returning a not guilty verdict. Penelope left from Montreal with Hugo and Marcella the next morning. Lottie, much shaken by the winter's events, found a locum for her clinic and took off with Max for two weeks in Portugal. I went to Michigan for a long weekend with the dog. They didn't have time or money for more vacation than that. Monday night, I got home. I found Hugo Wolf's Spanish's Liederbuch still open on the piano from January's dinner party with Chaim and Paul. Between Paul's murder and preparing for Penelope's trial, I hadn't sung since then. I tried picking out In dem Schatten meiner Locken, but Greta was right. The piano needed tuning badly. I called Mr. Fortieri the next morning to see if he would come by to look at it. He was an old man who repaired instruments for groups like the Aeolus Quintet and their ilk. He also tuned pianos for them. He only helped me because he'd known my mother and admired her singing. He arranged to come the next afternoon. I was surprised. Usually you had to wait four to six weeks for time on his schedule, but quickly reshuffled my own Tuesday appointments to accommodate him. When he arrived, I realized that he had come so soon because Chaim's suicide attempt had shaken him. I didn't have much stomach for rehashing it, but I could see the old man was troubled and needed someone to talk to. What bothers me, Victoria, is what I should do with his clarinet. I've been able to repair it, but they tell me he'll never play again. Surely it would be too cruel to return it to him even if I didn't submit a bill. His clarinet? I asked blankly. When did he give it to you? After that disastrous West Coast tour. He said he had dropped it in some mud. I still don't understand how that happened, why he was carrying it outside without the case. But he said it was clogged with mud and he tried cleaning it. Only he'd bent the keys and it didn't play properly. It was a wonderful instrument, only a few years old, and costing perhaps $6,000. So I agreed to work on it. He had to use his old one in California, and I always thought that was why the tour went so badly. That and Paul's death weighing on him, of course. And so you repaired it and got it thoroughly clean. I said foolishly. Oh, yes. Of course, the sound will never be as good as it was originally, 
but it would still be a fine instrument for informing use. Only, I hate having to give him a clarinet he can no longer play. Leave it with me, I said gently. I'll take care of it. Mr. Forcieri seemed relieved to pass the responsibility on to me. He went to work on the piano and tuned it back to perfection without any of his usual criticisms on my failure to keep to my mother's high musical standard. As soon as he'd gone, I drove down to the University of Chicago Hospital. Chaim was being kept in the psychiatric wing for observation, but he was allowed visitors. I found him sitting in the lounge, staring into space while people's court blared meaninglessly on the screen overhead. He gave his sad, sweet smile when he saw me and croaked out my name in the hoarse parody of a voice. Can we go to your room, Heim? I want to talk to you privately. He flicked a glance at the vacant faces around us but got up obediently and led me down the hall to a spartan room with bars on the window. Mr. Forcieri was by this afternoon to tune my piano. He told me about your clarinet. Crime said nothing, but he seemed to relax a little. How did you do it, Chaim? I mean, you left for California Monday morning. What did you do? Come back on the red eye? Red Eye, he croaked hoarsely. Even in the small space, I had to lean forward to hear him. The night flight. Oh, the Red Eye. Yes, yes, I got to O'Hare at six. Came to Paul's office on the L. And was back at the airport in time for the ten o'clock flight. No one even knew I'd left L.A. We had a rehearsal at two, and I was there easily. His voice was so strained it made my throat ache to listen to him. I thought I hated Paul. You know, all those remarks of his about responsibility. I thought he'd encouraged Greta to leave me. He stopped to catch his breath. After a few gasping minutes, he went on. I blamed him for her idea that she didn't have to feel any obligation to our marriage. Then, after I got back, I saw Lottie had been right. Greta was just totally involved in herself. She should have been named Narcissus. She used Paul's words without understanding them. But Penelope, I said, would you really have let Penelope go to jail for you? He gave a twisted smile. I didn't mean them to arrest Penelope. I just thought, I've always had trouble with cold weather, with Chicago winters. I've worn a long fur for years. Because I'm so small, people often think I'm a woman when I'm wrapped up in it. I just thought, if anyone saw me, they would think it was a woman. I never meant them to arrest Penelope. He sat panting for a few minutes. What are you going to do now, Vic? Send for the police. I shook my head sadly. You'll never play again. You'd have been happier doing life in Joliet than you will now that you can't play. I want you to write it all down, though. The name you used on your night flight and everything. I have the clarinet. Even though Mr. Fortieri cleaned it, a good lab might still find blood traces. The clarinet in your statement will go to the papers after you die. Penelope deserves that much, to have the cloud of suspicion taken away from her. And I'll have to tell her and Lottie. His eyes were shiny. You don't know how awful it's been, Vic. I was so mad with rage. Like nothing to break Paul's neck. But then, after that, I couldn't play anymore. So you were wrong. Even if I had gone to Joliet, I would still never have played. I 
couldn't bear the naked anguish in his face. I left without saying anything. But it was weeks before I slept without seeing his black eyes weeping onto me. This story is taken from A Woman's Eye, edited by Sarah Peretsky. All rights reserved. Narration by Jenna Leishman. Music by Craig Harris. <laughs>